Okay, I'd like to start off uh, this afternoon's uh, worker panel by, uh, if those of you who are paying attention, there's a gross Freudian slip in front of you right now that, that I've committed. Is anyone noticing it? Has anyone noticed what it is? Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. It has something to do with oh, I'm standing in front of it. <laughs> okay, what's wrong with that picture? What does it read? What does it read? What do we need to do to retain and retain our workers? Obviously, you know where I am, what I'm worried about, okay? So, anyways, re, re, the word should have been recruited. Retain and retain has some applicability, though, John. Yeah, okay, well, I, I don't know what level that my monkey brain is working on, but evidently, uh, uh, retain is definitely on my mind. And it's in that spirit that we've convened our worker panel today. Um, at the end of today, I would like to have some pretty good ideas about what it is the industry needs to do to retain, retain, and recruit its workers. How we arrive at that, I'm going to say we've given ourselves considerable latitude, and it's my pleasure to introduce the panel who are, are going to assist us in this, and that we're going to, uh, in, in, I mean, they are basically tree planters, you can't tell them to, what to do very much anyways. Or does that, does that advise, from, I'm sure you can, you can come back. But we, we're going to give them lots of latitude to talk, and we're hopefully that you and the other receiving end will go back and forth. But initially, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Scooter Clark. Some of you may know Scooter from his work on Replant. Okay, excellent blogger. We have Mike Renault, Sarah Lococo, Jordan Teslock, and Natalia Lee. So I guess we need to make them feel comfortable. I'd also like to say that the design of the stage comes from Oprah. We've done this. I have to consult with them. But this is the best way to make people feel comfortable. So I, I told them all, like, I don't want you to go and create a big presentation. We're not asking you to sit here and remedy all of the, 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 uh, the industry's issues. But I did sort of want to say that I was going to ask them a couple leading questions, but that they weren't limit, necessarily limited to them. So what I'm going to propose is that I start off by uh, having each one of them introduce themselves a little bit better than what I just did, do a bit of their background, and go through that. That'll get them used to talking. Then we're going to come back and we'll sort of go through some issues around what, where, you know, what are the important things to them. What, what is the state? What's it like to go back to the uh, adaptive, or I should say the... Um, What's the name? The inquisitive inquiry. No, the, the <laughs> that's appreciative. appreciative inquiry. What's it like to work in the industry today? That's basically one of the general questions. So first of all, um, starting with you, Jonathan, just introduce yourself. I've given a bit of a, bit of a reference, but tell me, tell us about yourself a bit. Uh, I guess, well, <coughs> replant's probably what you know me most for, but uh, I've got quite a solid planting and supervising and forming. Uh, season ahead of me, I guess, this summer. Uh, I'm looking at about 180 days between some coastal planting uh, with one company and then some uh, supervising in the summer up in the interior. So hopefully I can bring a couple different perspectives to the panel, but uh, definitely from the worker side. So how long have you been in the industry? Uh, 1990. 1990, okay. Yeah. Mike? Uh, my name is Mike. I'm in go finishing up my fifth year of a poli sci philosophy double major at UVic. I'm 23 and noticeably younger than a good chunk of the room. And I've done okay. four seasons. What does that mean? <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit. I've done four seasons of planting. I'm a student planter and I'll be planting this summer with someone. And we'll see how much planting I do after that. With some. Yeah. Um, my name is Sarah. Uh, I've got 12 years uh, active involvement in the industry at this point. Um, up north, down south, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, a little bit on the coast, uh, spraying work, so I've run the gambit and uh, I guess this is kind of a bit of a milestone I think what's going on here today because I don't really recall in 12 years being asked too much what I thought about anything. Uh, and also I think this is a really cool opportunity to finally get to see what the men in the room do when they're deciding what's going to happen in our lives. So, uh, anyways. Um, I'm Jordan Teslock. I put in 15 years of planting with 10 different companies. Um, after that I got involved in doing some research that John and Chris had mentioned earlier. It was on workforce attitudes and job satisfaction. A lot of that um, turned into consulting activity and volunteer activity on various committees, basically relaying worker concerns to the industry. 
Um, I don't think it was ever necessarily a position of being a representative, but it was more about being a person who had the chance to observe and hear what was going on. And, and spy. Part, and spy, yeah. <laughs> and, and relay sort of those general observations and findings about that sort of very unique employer-employee relationship in civil culture to the industry. And my interest in it, um, a, a, for a lot of it, has been sort of primarily about safety as well, about um, retaining workers and holding on to that training investment. There's been such a huge amount of progress made in making the industry safer um, and wanting to protect those improvements that we've made. So in a sense, um, I'm now an auditor with the BC Forest Safety Council and I haven't done a full season of tree planting in five years now, but I've maintained a lot of that dialogue with the workers, um, and I also maintain dialogue with a lot of the contractors um, under the belief that a healthy employer-employee dialogue is going to be a positive thing for the industry. Natalia. Uh, my name is Natalia Hotova. Lee's my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> it's my working name. Uh, I've been a tree planner for a decade, and it was my first major career. Um, I haven't so much transitioned out of tree planting as I've expanded my skill base into, I'm currently at school, uh, for fine art. <coughs> I'm the other one laughing. <laughs> yeah, I'm a performance major, so I, I'm looking to pursue a career in performing and in art, uh, so tree planting is also, I think, will remain uh, my job for a long time. Can I, can I ask you to start then? What, what's it like to work in the industry? Now there's a wide open question for you. Give, what are some of the impressions that leave your mind right away? I work for uh, a notably wonderful company. Uh, and I think that what has set them apart in my mind is just the level of respect that I was given as a person um, and that my basic needs were always um, and continue to be maintained at a level that's quite comfortable, which um, relative to the early experiences I had in tree planting, which were pretty, I mean, back in the early 2000s, um, I was 18, lots of mud, lots of kegs of beer in the middle of the bush, and, and just like a general sense of, um, Here, I'm not sure if there was a protocol, I don't really know what it was. Um, but I, I definitely feel like now my longevity in the business has been partially just because I'm able to go to work and come home. And uh, that's, that it's a simple transition. Okay. Want to work back this way again? Did, do you want to answer that? What's it? You, you're, you can't really answer that question, but I'll come back to you in a minute because you've been still looking from the outside. So, Sarah, what, what, how would you characterize? Can you answer the question again? What's it? Okay, I'm, I'm, my question is, and you're not limited in your answer, but okay. you know, what's it like to work in the industry? It's a broad point, and if you can refine that, if you wish, to what is it you like about the industry? And, and that's already been what Natalia began to talk a bit about. With some of this you mentioned respects, you mentioned the, you know, the kind of transitions, points, and so forth. Okay, let me see what I can do with that. That's pretty wide open and I'll probably get better as things go along and the questions are a bit more pointed and not that huge, but uh, and in terms of what I like about the industry, it's changed so much as you were mentioning and it really varies company per company. Like I've worked for some very, well, no names, but some very, very bad men and some very, very good men and I've been treated horribly and I've been treated very, very well. So there's, there's huge discrepancies within the industry. So what I like, I guess, overall is being outdoors, um, the freedom, working hard, being in good shape, being paid well when I'm paid well. And um, it's just unique, tree planting, obviously. There's nothing like it, you know what I mean? There's no, there's no industry like it. Um, like I said, I'll have better, uh, more well formulated thoughts as things okay. progress. I just get going. Yeah. Okay, can I ask you at this point? You mentioned uh, without going and naming any names. Yeah. What, what was it that was, when you were having a bad experience? What constituted? What, what made up for? What, what, 
were the things that were happening to you that you didn't feel made it attractive to you to work the, the batting? Just okay. Um, I think uh, without going into specific instances, I guess you can just say just a blatant lack of respect, uh, being patronized, you know, overall treated like a child, um, disgusting hours at times, uh, just. Like real abuse in some cases, and some real outrageous stories that a lot of people wouldn't believe that have regular everyday jobs, and you tell them the kind of, for lack of a better word, shit that you've gone through planting, and they wouldn't believe it. And, um, like I said, for specific stories, and I'm not talking about working in bad weather or any of that kind of jazz because we all have to do that. I'm talking about blatant being treated like a piece of garbage or being treated really wonderful. But the thing about planting is you get so used to in a to a large degree, especially earlier in your career, um, at least a decade ago, being treated so horribly that even the tiniest bit of respect is like a revelation for you and it's just wonderful. Um, but in my last six years, I've been treated so wonderfully that it's it's just, a, it's such a difference. But like I said, I can get more into okay. the differences later well, on. Well, Mike's nodding his head in agreement, so Mike, keep agreeing, well, tell us what you're, uh, I was going to say, one of the major things I've noticed starting since 2008, uh, I haven't seen much variation in pay. Most of the companies I've worked for, I felt paid relatively, like, appropriately, more or less, percentage point here or there. But the major differences, um, from my perspective, were in amounts of respect and amounts of honesty. And honesty is a big one, where companies have the opportunity to be really straightforward and provide good information to the planters, or have the opportunity to keep things quiet and maybe not warn the planters of things like 15-day gaps coming up in the season. And those sorts of things, I think, are opportunities that contractors can take advantage of to make the planters happier without any additional cost. Because planters like to know what's going on as much as possible, and planters like to feel that their contract is, you know, treating them well and being honest with them and being straightforward with them. And I think a large part of that comes from passing on information, being really fair to your employee, and that that doesn't have to cost more money from the bottom line, but can just be a treatment thing and a way of interacting with the planters. And I'd like to shout out my buddy Scooter here, that he was very, very good at that this season, like very good at giving out information. Sorry to put you on the spot. Okay, Scooter. I think most people say I'm too verbose, but that's good. That's well, good. you and John would be well. <laughs> um, Sarah mentioned respect, and I think that's a good point. Um, I didn't really want to bring up any names, but I guess I have to in this one. Um, a lot of people have asked why I keep working with Folklore instead of some of the other companies I've worked for. And uh, one thing that I've always tried to teach my camp is that um, a phrase is, do the right thing even when no one's looking. So let's say it's the end of the day, the whole crew's in the truck, you've just finished up a block, and someone finds a two bundle hole at the back of the block. I want to know that even though nobody would know the difference, someone's gonna go back and fill that hole, do the right thing. And uh, <clears throat> a couple years ago, I got a, uh, well, you know how there's, there's some companies, and generally not the ones in this room, looking around at this crowd, but there's some companies that will try to, try to shave or cut corners, shave expenses, stuff like that. They may not uh, always pay for all the things that they could, stuff like that. A couple years ago, I got a phone call in the fall, and uh, Kurt and Deanna called me and said, listen, we, uh, we found a mistake in your payroll from three years ago, and we owe you several thousand dollars. So, you know, something like that, they didn't have to do. I never would have noticed, but things like that, respect, that makes a huge difference, so. Thanks. Jordy, do you want to comment from, 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 on those things? Here, hearing respect, honesty, communication? I think, I think there's a, a, a wide bounds of these affinities between the employer and the employee. I think some of the things that Mike said really remind me a lot of when I go to company to company and I deal with the contractors. I deal with you, the company owners, quite often. I'll be interviewing people as part of the audit. One thing to take note of are uh, our company owners that really know the names of every single employee. And I'm talking even large companies. Um, I'll talk to a large company owner who has over 100 people on staff and we'll be chit-chatting about where I'm gonna go and they'll, and they'll know the names of almost every person in that camp and a few details about the person. I know that's not always possible 
um, you know, in a large organization. I know that there's already so much information the contractors have to manage. But I do take note of that and I do notice that there are some remarkable differences between companies and I think it can sometimes reflect something about that relationship. I don't want to say that I'm judging the company about whether or not they do that, but I'm saying it's a bit of a reflection of the type of relationship that they're making an effort to nurture with their workers. And I think that that's something that maybe people don't put a big value on sometimes, but may really affect your ability to attract people to work with you and make them want to come back year after year. Would, Natalia, would you recommend this to a, a rookie to join the civil culture, to work in, it in, the, in this civil culture industry right now? Yeah, I had a great opportunity. Um, I go to school and I like to write. So I write for the paper at our school and I've written a couple of articles about tree planting. And I, I always find writing a really, ex, you know, exposes a lot about what I think that I didn't know that I thought. And um, I ended up having, it was really endearing when I was writing the stuff about tree planting, when I, I talked about the difficulties that can be expected, what a first time planter would, would want to look out for. Um, and the, but as I wrote, I realized that part of that stuff is inescapable, just working with the weather and working with large groups of people that you don't know. And for newcomers coming into the industry, um, if they're young as well, dealing with the anxiety that just is a, about learning to live with yourself and live with other people. And, and facilitating some of that personal development um, and just acknowledging that sometimes anxiety and all of those problems that psychological kind of stuff, growing up stuff that happens when you're hiring young people into a workforce um, can be softened by just, you know, making friends and smiling and just basic friendship stuff about how to Remember that you're dealing with people, and they're just people, and regardless of how, how many years they have in the industry. Um, but another point that came through is the feedback that I got was that there's a lot of really eager young people looking at, like, they've, they've read the article and were, and were really interested in knowing more about the industry and where to go. And I would direct them to treeplanter.com, which I thought was a fairly good resource, but I didn't have any specifics of how they could get in into the industry in the same way that I was because I work for a company that generally won't hire, you know, without a couple of years experience. And when I thought back on my early experience of being a tree planter, I, I don't know if I would recommend that to somebody. I mean, I did it, but I, and it was okay, but a lot of these are young, intelligent people that come from nice families and I, I was like, well, I don't know if you would enjoy going <laughs> and doing that because it, it would be challenging, but I don't know if the work itself would be challenging. I just, the, the environment would be, and that, that was so, and I guess in me saying that, I realized that sometimes the environment that you're working in and the, the conditions that you're working with are hard to extrapolate. Sarah, you were nodding. Did you want to enlarge or something? Um, at which point, <laughs> I agreed with a lot that's been set up until now. Like, um, as far as recommending rookies to yeah, join sure. the industry, um, although, like, in terms of remuneration and whatnot, like we all know that rates, if you incorporate inflation and everything else, there's been no uh, prices of anything have declined. What is it, thirty percent? I was reading the articles on the site over the last ten years, so I'm never going to recommend anyone to do it from. Uh, uh, fiscal standpoint, right? But in terms of character building and, and that type of thing, I think it's perfect. And I think, it, if anything, everyone should do it at least once, right? But my cousin was actually who I was telling they should go do this. But she's, she's young and she doesn't really have any financial concerns at this juncture and whatnot. But if it was, were a little further down the road where she had some real concrete worries and that kind of jazz, I wouldn't be encouraging her to do it because it's just not... Um, it's not profitable enough, and she might suffer. Do you know what I mean? Well, that she wouldn't make enough money, and that, or that she would actually be, didn't have the, the, the feck, if I could use that word, the kind of grit. Oh, to... no, 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 you know what? Um, you're actually very surprised because you really never know who's gonna make it through and, and who's gonna fall apart because you'll have some of the loudest 
uh, loud mouth, hard rocks, and you think they're just going to excel and do wonderful, and you know they're the ones that are crying in a puddle two weeks in, and then you'll have this tiny, you know, buck twenty little girl who just, uh, you know what I mean? She I excels, do she does well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? She makes good money. She enjoys herself. She hardens right up, and she does what she needs to do. Because it's about not wasting a step. It's not about being tough as nails. It's about it's being efficient, right? It's all about being efficient. But um, as far as just cost of living and everything else nowadays, it, it's hard. It's hard. And, uh, you know, unless you're going to get yourself together and get something else going on in the off season that, that's profitable, um, you, you're going to have a hard time. And unless you're really keen on just living off the fat, if you have any at the end, or uh, sitting around in the eye, which is, you know, I don't, I don't really know who who wants to do that anymore, right? So I mean, I'm getting kind of a, I'm getting two, I'm getting a mixed signal from both of you on this one. Is sort of, there's a, yeah, it's great work, but I'm not sure I'd recommend it to someone else, which is kind of the, the an interesting, am I getting that? Am I gonna, I'd recommend it for character building, but I agree, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, fiscally, it works for me, having knowledge of the industry and knowing my, like, but I, for a young person, I don't know, because I don't work directly with people that don't know how to plan, uh, how long, what the learning curve is like. I mean, and if you can, you know, I can say to somebody, are you interested in snowboarding? Well, it takes about, you know, three or four days to pick it up, yeah, well, yeah. you know, a week. But for tree planting, it's like, it when, at what point can I say to somebody, you know, you'll go home with about, you know, if you work this many months, then you will be able to save this much money, which I think for, young people, I mean that was my motivation for tree planting. Okay, so how much money can I make? Okay, great. I'll do it. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something. I think it's something that I, I've noticed quite a few times where people talk about the other things that draw them to the job. And, oh, I like to be outside and, you know, uh, there's a certain, there's a lot of characteristics about the tree planting job that I think historically have, has really supported it. That the industry and the contractors have been, basically relied upon many factors other than financial reward bringing people back year after year. And there's a certain cultural cachet that goes along with tree planting. You said it, I think everybody should do it. There's a list of famous Canadians that have tree planted. Shania Twain apparently tree planted for like a week or something, I don't remember. <laughs> but um, but you, you hear about these things and, and I think there is a certain attraction to the job. Um, and one of the things when I talk to contractors is say, you know, about the changes in the workforce, they say, more and more people are saying, well, they're more money oriented. The, the workers are more money oriented. It's not so much about the lifestyle and the, the parties or the wildness of it. And I, I really sometimes wonder if something about the job is actually starting to change, and part of it is becoming more formalized and more, you know, I think the, the formalization of safety has really brought a new type of routine to the job. And I start to wonder if maybe the industry should really be very concerned that those things, other than financial incentives that really draw people, if those are being eroded, and if that's really gonna pose a serious challenge to the industry. If you, if you only have the, the monetary reward to draw people to the industry, and if you start looking at the numbers and the figures, and it's not painting a very good picture, well, what's that going to say to your potential recruit pool? Especially when we have some of the negative stories, like the case that was not named earlier. Um, when you have that being put out there as the image, and the social image of this industry has suffered some fairly serious slings and arrows over the last couple of years. And I think that's something that the industry as a whole should be deeply concerned about and should be working to not only correct, but to repair the conditions that, that make people think, well, that's not why I'm there for it, there for it anymore. If, if people are doing it for the experience, well, you have to make sure that it's a good experience again. So that, that continues to draw people back. Okay, well, they're not doing it strictly for the experience. It's a combination of things. And I, from a cultural standpoint, I don't think that uh, planter culture or camp culture or whatever the hell you want to call it is eroding per se. But because of the fact that in a lot of cases remuneration isn't adequate, people are forced to focus solely on that because they're trying desperately to survive in this world while crippling themselves doing an extremely debilitating job. And no, I'm not whining. I'm just telling it like it is. And uh, you know what I mean? So they're being forced to keep up with but. but Camp culture, it's still there, and it's still, it's alive and well, and um, I don't even really think that that's the kind of thing that needs to be 
fostered so much or nurtured or anything because it it um, it will surface and it will develop and it'll evolve on its own no matter what. When you take a group of people, you stick them out in the middle of nowhere, you make them work like dogs all day long, they're gonna get close. Yeah, they might even get closer. I hate to, uh, I don't really wanna give you this ammo, but tighter, <laughs> tighter in their discontent than they're gonna get when they're treated in ideal conditions. But that's gonna happen no matter what. But I think that one way they could foster uh, indirectly the, the, the uh, the evolution and the continuing growth or whatever the hell you want to call it of the culture is to pay people properly so they can focus on enjoying each other and enjoying being there and all the other things because they are a huge draw and any planter that tries to tell you it's just about the money again pardon my language they're full of shit they don't want to admit that it's a huge community thing it's a culture thing it's a self-worth thing it's you know what I mean it's like real humanity as cheesy as that may sound to some of you and well it shouldn't because you've been out there right um, there's a whole different aspect of it that, uh, that keeps you there. And there, there are the purely mercenary planters, but I think that they're rare, you know what I mean? And you wave a carrot in front of their face and they're gonna jump around wherever. But for the most part, if you're really, really treating people properly, and all you contractors out there, I'm not saying rip off your planters, but I'm just saying you don't really need to be paying them through the nose if you're treating them properly, they'll stick around. And uh, the mercenaries, they're gonna take off no matter what because they're always going to uh, fall prey to the whole greener pastures, um, I guess, legend that's always floating around the planting would have been so much better on the other side. Well, anyways. If, Mike, go back to the, I'll come back to you in a minute, Jordan. Mike, go back to the original, follow on her comment, on, on, or if go back to the original, would you recommend this to people as the original? Yeah. Previously, I hadn't been recommending this to friends, for the most part. Um, from my perspective, planting is only going to pay off if you do it for several years, and the odds of it paying off substantially keep getting lower as wages against inflation decrease. So for the student planter, a student planter needs to be able to pull out more or less 10 grand a year to you know, stay in school working part-time through the school year to pay for um, their expenses. In terms of numbers of rookies that I think make that in a season these days, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that last season it would have been like 10 or 15% of rookies in camp might have hit that number, and I think that that number probably has been going down. So as a financial thing, I don't recommend it. As an experience thing, I think that's a more interesting question, and I know that uh, Jordan and Sarah would like to lean on it. Um, I don't think it's that beautiful an experience. Maybe I'm a little bit too cynical, a little bit too money driven. I've never quit a contract. I've always worked every contract I've worked to the end date, and that's a point of pride for me. But I also have not yet returned to a company with that's one nice. exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I am that like mercenary planter. But I actually don't think that like I'm going to find something vastly better each season. I'm just looking for something a little bit different, with a little bit of the trade-off of organization against money against community, and it's just a balancing of those factors, figuring out what works perfectly for you. And I think that some people, yeah, you're completely. Right. Sarah will be very happy making whatever, getting that experience, but different people are going to weigh the money aspect to a different weight depending on that person. And I think that for a good chunk of student planters, the money aspect isn't being weighed well enough um, to make it worth their while in the end. On the other hand, I just was like doing some numbers before this on those new minimum wage laws. A 12 hour day of which the last four hours are time and a half is 140 bucks. My average in my rookie season as like the third rookie of 35 rookies, I mean most of them didn't work the last day, but whatever, that's beside the point, um, was $158 in my rookie season. Um, so we're getting close to a minimum wage that resembles rookie averages, and so that would be something that makes it more worthwhile for rookies to come into the industry, especially when you compare city work opportunities. How that exactly that will play off still depends on things like the amount of July work that's available because that's when a rookie is going to make a lot more money. And so, I don't know, I generally don't recommend it to people. I think that I'll persist in generally not recommending it to people. Jordy, did you want to add a quick comment? Yeah, no, just sort of um, a, a, a bit more building on, on what um, Sarah and I both talked to. I, I don't necessarily think that, um, or maybe I chose my words poorly, not necessarily that the camp culture is eroded, but that there's a certain type of experience and a certain type of culture and a certain type of 
um, something that goes on in tree planting other than the money that the industry has always offered. And they have been successful in attracting recruits because that's always matched an interest and, a, and, and, a, and an appetite in their pool of recruits. There's always been a pool of recruits that has looked at what planting that had to offer and said, I want that. I don't think necessarily the planting experience has necessarily changed all that much, but I think that you have to remember silviculture does not exist in a bubble. You have to look at what's happening in society. I think we see an interesting contrast that there's even a generation between myself and Mike here, and that the interest and the cultural appetites of your young recruit pool in Canada, I think they have shifted substantially in the last 20, even in the last 10 years. And that's something that maybe in the big picture, the industry does need to look, look at and go, well, we've been successful in the past and just drawing endless recruits and lineups of young people wanting to jump on the bus and come out west to do this experience of tree planting. Right. Well, I don't know if that hunger in the young population of those ideal recruits for the job is the same given the current image of the industry. And that's something that I think begs examination, not necessarily um, fixing the culture of the industry. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I still think it's one of the best features and one of the things that really makes me enjoy working with it. But I think you really need to evaluate your relationship with the labor pool that you're drawing from, especially when there's these other hydraulics in other industries that want to pull people out of it. Um, Mike expressed the, the idea there about the minimum wage, about that being rewarding for rookies. Well, I'm wondering if maybe it's the opposite, that if a young rookie is guaranteed to get 10.25 an hour for slinging donuts or mowing lawns, that the trade-off between that and going tree planting, if that's what they're gonna get, well, it seems a little easier to stay home um, and sling donuts or clip lawns or something like that, rather than go off to a strange place where there's a lot of non-guaranteed factors at play. I think, I think there's a difference too between coastal and career planters probably put a little bit more emphasis on the culture and the younger planters put a little bit more emphasis on paying their tuition. Mm -hmm. So, although there's, there's some, some in each. But one thing that really annoys me is you look at a planter and some people say, okay, these planters are making $200 a day. That's a lot of money. Well, it is in a day, but if you think that a lot of them work 50 days a year, that's, you know, that's the same as saying, okay, I'm working every Thursday for the next year. That's not a lot of work in the course of a year, so to try and pay for your entire year in 50-day summer season is a little tricky. It's different for coastal planters, career planters, but, uh, but that's certainly something that I would think is a bit of a concern. So it is good money, but I mean, you could, you could be a waitress at the local Husky House in a 12-hour shift to make 200 bucks. Scooter, would you recommend people to take up the industry? No. No. Um, if, if somebody approaches me about three times saying they're interested in becoming a planter, a first-time planter, then I look at them and say, okay, maybe you have the mindset, you're stubborn enough, yes, I will give you some contacts, whatnot. But for somebody who just out of the blue thinks, yeah, I think I should try and be a planter, I've read about it for an hour or two, seems interesting. I think that's a huge mistake on their part. Unless I can tell they've done a lot of research and they really understand, which I don't think they can, but if, if they think they really understand and they look like they put a whole, whole lot of effort in, yes, then I would, I would say go ahead. For most people, no. So am I getting the impression that you want to protect some people from themselves from going tree planting? Yeah. <laughs> am, I, am I getting that? Is that well, you know what it can be? It's frustrating as a supervisor seeing all these people that I've talked to five or six times in the months leading up to the season and they're so excited about their job, they're talking about what they're going to do with their money and then the third week of May they're crying and they quit. It's, yeah, it's a little frustrating. Is that because of money or because of character? Are you just speaking to what's been going on forever? Yeah. Because that thing, in terms of preparation, like did you have preparation? Would you have somebody that's like, I can get you a job and you took it, you know what I mean? What the hell did we know? Nothing, right? You know, they have this incredible advantage that we didn't have. That's true. Able to sit that's there true. Reams and reams of paper and forums and all this other crap before they decided yeah. to take the job. Do you know what I mean? In fact, I think anyone that's bothering to do that much research into it probably isn't the type to do to go out there. I hate to break it to you. 
Anyway, sorry. I wonder if I can. Okay, one of the. Okay, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm reading. To, I want to just ask the contractors in the audience, and, I'm, and I know you're, some of you are probably chomping to get a few words in here. I just want to know right now, um, how many are you getting applications? Are you still get? Are still people? Admittedly, we got to. Not everyone cuts that makes the, the cut. But are we still getting people that want to come from whatever, ill-informed or misinformed or deluded or whatever the reason might be, risk-taking, personality deficits, or just, <laughs> you know, what, are we getting, are we getting those applicants and uh, who wants to do, what's it looking like? Chris? For, for rookie applicants, you get far too many, right? You, you, and, I mean, we all know, I mean, at least I've, I have not got a formula to figure out who's going to be successful and who's not okay. going to be the successful. But the question is, you are but getting... I'm getting lots of rookie applicants, more than I want, okay. for rookies. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, you're probably as picky as these guys about who you pick, as they are, well, as they recommend. I mean, John, that's if I knew how to do it, I would be picky, but it's, it's tough. You, okay. I don't know how to, to All right, check so you're, you're getting lots of... Okay, yeah. quickly, uh, Judy, did you have your hand up there? Things are put together, and 
isn't discussed and, and isn't available in, in, a, in a way that's, um, that's that accessible. Well, so, you know, it, it, just let me elaborate, but that's an interesting point, because if you think about how many people have been through this, if you, if you will, a Canadian right, Okay, if you say there's been 30,000, uh, know, I mean, I don't know. There, if in, in you use that that thing about the six st stages of separation, or tree planting in particular has to be one of the most widespread Canadian cultural experiences. I think probably has to be. Why it hasn't? Why, I'm always perplexed that that resident perspective hasn't been a groundswell around the issues around forest. That we've got 18 million hectare going. Where are all those people? I mean, and, and we, uh, there, you know, we've had, as you will find out, there's, there's a, sprinkled all throughout the executive fashions of bureaucracies, throughout companies. Uh, you're always running into people who've done this, literally. So I'm just wondering if maybe there's a failing on our part to actually not put you in. Like, did you realize this is really where your job comes from? Yeah. Is, is not well understood, and that's a, that's an interesting point. And and because in a sense. You asked me, what can we do to make things better? I think that's starting to look like, you know, we were talking earlier about what we do to make contractors bid higher, which I think a more specific thing. But part of that is, you know, if we don't have a public push on policy, um, and if you people come into our industry and leave it and are no the wiser about what was going on and where they were, we've kind of failed as an industry. Well, you've got, you've recruited these intelligent, largely people that are in school and willing to learn and have an appetite for that kind of thing. So it makes sense to just offer them a little bit of information about the fact that they're in the forestry industry and what forestry means in Canada. I mean, having that information, and maybe that's not, I mean, that just might be my interest, but that, that that's an area that would be kind of like putting together a coloring book for tree planters. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. That's, a, that's a pretty good one. Can okay, I so interject something here? Or you can interject. No, you interject? No, I, I don't know. <laughs> so just let me my thoughts clear here. Um, I can tell you what makes people stay and why they stick around. I can even tell you how to recruit people and how to take that university work pool and say the right things, do the right things, kind of co-op them into turning into career silviculturists instead of just, you know, a little five-year investment that pisses off and goes against their real job, for lack of a better word. But uh, I can only tell you how to do that with people that fit into the type of, um, that's the right word, whatever character pool that we all came from, right? But what I'm hearing from what they're saying is lack of applicants, what Mike here is saying, like, are you telling me that that type of person doesn't exist anymore? Because, do well, you know what I mean? I, mean, I, I, we, we I can't, I can't tell you how to recruit this new breed if, it, you yeah, know what I mean? all, if they're okay. totally fickle and all they care about is making a dollar and bouncing around and do you know what I mean? Well, there's a, have there's no a, attention span and what, what am I supposed to tell you about these people? <laughs> Well, to be absolutely <laughs> fair, I don't think that I'm the typical university planner, um, by a good margin. Also, that like, I don't think I fit that character pool. I actually was a person who like read through all of the replant.ca archives before getting my first planting job. And to be fair, everyone thought that they they were completely certain that I wasn't going to make it in my rookie season. Um, I did say you never yeah. know. You do. I didn't qualify you that. do never know. Um, as for the character pool. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a great answer, but I just wanted to say, like, let's not belittle the five-year investment. Like, if you could get every one of your planters to last five years, no, no, no. that was, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, but, yeah I, I understand, but yeah, even if you could get all of your university planters to last for four years, that would be a lot better than the number of rookies that I see quit every year, the number of second-year planters that quit every year. There's also a question about retaining even the, like, second- and third-year planters to get them to four years, to get them to five years, because I can't remember where I read this, but I read somewhere way back, when you average it all out, the average number of years that a planter plants is, like, 2.7. It's like once you average out all the like fast quitting rookies and all those second year planters that don't come back against all of the handful of like long term planters, you don't even get to three years. And I think that the industry could strongly benefit from getting people to consistently last to four years or five years. And that's a question. Okay. Can I just go back to the audience? Uh, Marianne, you had a question. Well, I actually don't have a question. I have a, a bit of a comment from someone 
outside the silviculture side. Okay. You're, you're no, loud I don't need that. <laughs> outside silviculture, but inside forestry, because Nat Natalia makes a very good point. If you don't understand where your piece fits into the bigger picture and the continuum of the forest industry, then you just feel like that peanut guy out there digging his face in the dirt. We're facing the same thing with logging contractors and trackers. They don't understand where they fit into the bigger picture. Um, it, just on a, on a bit of a side note, I mean, the CILA 100% supports the WSCA because if you guys don't plant trees, we got nothing to harvest. And the pulp mill guys don't get it into their head that if there's no logs and timber, there is no pulp chips and there's no wood pellets. And we need to have a better picture of, of the bigger industry and where all those pieces fit in. Having said that, one of your points on the board there is about the image of the industry. And the forest industry's image is crap. I can't find anybody, I can't find a logger who's told his kids to go be a logger in the last 10 years. They've all said, go to university. God's sake, don't go plant trees, sorry. <laughs> and get an education, learn how to run a computer. And so that whole thing, we all are sharing that fate. Now part of that, and, and I mean, you guys know me mostly, I call a spade a spade. You have some serious image issues with silviculture particularly. And I'll give you a little story. Last summer, I happened to be flying out of Prince George and there was two young people standing there Obviously tree planters, so that already says something, right? The, the hair, the clothes, the dirty. Finished their last day. They're at the airport counter to get, to go home, and their paychecks had bounced. And they're standing there balling, debit card between them, there's not enough to pay for the tickets. So I just ponied up for the tickets and sent them home. What kind of bullshit is that? There was 50 people standing there going, Goddamn tree planting companies don't pay their workers. I go, I live in Prince George on a Saturday. There's you guys' pickups in front of the liquor store, and the beer is coming out by the case. What's the image the public is seeing? I get a phone call this summer that there's a tree planter truck took out a power pole and they quickly pulled it out of the ditch with another tree planter truck, and the cops found it down at Walmart and everybody disappeared. What's the image? What's the message? You've got a big PR problem. So do we. And so we need to be working together to try and do that. The other thing is we've been hearing for the last 10 years, forestry is a sunset industry. And people have bought that. They believe that. And so we can talk about character pools and cultures and all that. The fact is, first of all, we can't compete money-wise. The oil patch will pay three times. I mean, I can't get anybody in our industry. We pay more than you guys. We have this terrible <coughs> cultural image, you know, as, it, it, as a whole industry. And then you got the subsectors. And we need to deal with those things because you're not going to attract people. You can't <coughs> attract people. And, and the mills can't get people. And those were always good paying jobs. But the industry as a whole has a serious PR issue. And the industry as a whole most of Canadian society, at least forestry, is a done deal. We hear about the new knowledge economy and that, and so people are not encouraging their kids to look at forestry as a career. They look at, you're saying a five year career uh, as a tree planter, and then there's a few of you that go on as a culture, or as a career planter, contractors. Why aren't we moving into each other's space here and helping each other out? You got seasonal work, we got seasonal work. We need to start working this together. Um, guys that are on the ground doing vegetation management and stuff, they can move into machines for the winter, logging machines, we need them. And you can have them back in the summer. Let's get innovative and creative on some of this stuff and, and combine as a forest industry, keep our workforce. Because I think if, you, if we keep segregating, I need truckers and I need processor uppers and you need tree planters and you need brushers, we're not gonna make it. So there's my rant. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Michael, do you want to come up and join the panel with us here? Here you are, you're able to do that? Michael Mashevsky, uh, I've known Michael for quite a few years, and um, he organized, I think it was initially the Silviculture Workers Association of BC, I 
Thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm, I'm just well, that was the beginning of it. Yeah, the Civil yeah. Culture Workers Association of BC. Of BC. And of course, you were actually, I think, also, were you involved in when we first put together the Western Civil Cultural Contra, or what was it? Western Civil Cultural Civil, what were we? Oh, sure. Thank you. PRWA. Okay, and then you also worked on a, and I always loved the acronym CRUISE, which was the Canadian Reforestation and Environmental Workers Society. Um, and you got a chance to tour around quite a few camps a few years ago, and in an attempt to, quote, organize the workforce. So, Michael, what were your impressions of, of, the, of the workers then that you ran into, and how you were received? And, and tell us about the success, and, and, and where you think the industry is going, uh, now that you're sort of in a, working on your retirement a bit? It's a complex issue, isn't it? <laughs> we only got 10 minutes. <laughs> it, it strikes, given the fact that I've been out of the industry for five years in a very dramatic way, I mean, I was actually very present in it until about five years ago and was involved very closely with John and with Chris and, and uh, various people um, in a lot of policy making. Um, I feel like that Hotel California line, you know, you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> um, there, what can I say about it? I, I, I was involved from my first season as a labor activist, and I started in 1982, and I was a part of the first version of the PRWA, which, for those of you who don't know um, the history of this industry that well, is where the WSEA came from. And in fact, I don't know how many more people than Dirk and John are founding members of the PRWA in this room. Are there others? Tony, are you part of that? Tony? No. 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 Probably so, Graham was probably there. So Dirk and John basically are kind of the legacy, you know, that we as worker organizers, you know, they, they, we're part of the legacy of you guys starting the first worker organization. And what's happened, in my opinion, after 25 years of a large number of very dedicated, idealistic, generous, compassionate, crazy workers throwing their lives into trying to organize the workforce with no success in standard terms, is the WSCA has the ball in their hands. The WSCA is the worker organization in this industry now. And so that's one conclusion that I've drawn <laughs> from the, the entire process that's involved here. The WSCA represents the workforce. The, it's, a, it's an extraordinary industry. I mean, what other industry that is so labor dominated has the, has the management and the contractors representing themselves, so representing the workforce so effectively in policy terms, in terms of keeping the standards up, you know, do, it's remarkable. I mean, it's only, I suspect, because this organization was rooted in a worker organization at some point in time, and everybody practically in this room was a tree planter, or was a, a brusher, or was a worker of some kind and remembers it. And I remember my first season as a tree planter. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I mean, you know, uh, it, I walked, I, you know, after, years of, of being marginalized and, you know, this was a different time in the 60s and the 70s, I mean, you know, what have you, it was, it, was a, it was a very dramatic time. Suddenly, I found my people, you know, lots of them, and everybody in the camp was, you didn't know who was the contractor, they looked just like we did, they did the same things, we were probably the contractors, who knew who was the contractor half the time, I mean, we were trying to get the truck out of the mud, you know, and the truck basically was a $500 Ford that, you know, should have never been there, you know, it, it, it goes on and on, the early years, you know, what this industry came out of, it's a, it's a, it's a story that's not been told yet, and it's an incredible story, and people, you know, that I've been listening to on this, um, Set of couches that are, have been participating in that story, and they love that part of the story as well. That's the the drama of camp life, the culture, whatever you want to call it. You know, that will always be there in, in intense situations. But in practical terms, we missed the boat when in the 90s when I started the Civil Culture Workers Association because I was kind of outraged that when the NDP government was considering this transition program for a flagging logging industry in which they were going to retrain a large number of the workers there and offer them a 
substantial amount of money, $27,000 and a couple of years of training, but that was not being offered to the silviculture workers who, contrary to my impression from what's been said on this couch so far, many of them were far more diverse and far more long-term workers in the industry than I get the impression people here consider themselves to be. I mean, you know, they were brushers, spacers, you know, they'd been planning for 10 years. They, they saw a future, a potential for there to be a silviculture industry for the workers. I think there's a silviculture industry career for project managers, contractors, and supervisors. That is where the career is in this business. There is no career for a silviculture worker. And it doesn't sound like there's much appetite for one. You know, and I can see why. You know, the incentives aren't there. Even though many of the people sitting on this couch probably make more than 300, you know, $300 a day, not Mike withstanding and what have you, you know, there, where, where are the incentives? The incentives were inherent in the, the um, FRBC program, the new forest offerings, when there was a possibility to actually create a multi-skilled, workforce with the potential of doing a number of applications, not just tree planting, and that's another place we get, you know, sidetracked here. It's not just tree planting, it's sil silviculture is not just tree planting. I know it's the biggest dramatic element here, but in order for there to be a career in silviculture, there is, there's all the applications we've got listed, you know, and which a lot of people don't like to do. You know, not, a planter doesn't want to be a spacer or work with the wildfire, you know, at this point. The people who want to basically have a career is a very small demographic. There's about 15%. We discovered that at the end of cruise when we have been put several times to the test by the IWA. Do you want to unionize? We will help you. The pulp and paper workers, we will help you. We were ready. The climate was such that you guys needed to have an effective worker representation there to get these employment standards done. I was on up. Board to get fight at FISA, they needed a worker representation. I was there. I was. I mean, I've, I've been there a lot, and, uh, you know, because you needed to have worker representation. Without a work, without a valid worker organization, or without the, the workers really even recognizing that there was a whole political element to what they're doing, you know, um, it, it's a it's a, an extraordinary situation. But basically. We missed that boat because of the fact that about 15% of our cruise members said, yes, we want a union. 85% said, no, we don't want a union. We don't even want an association. We're, we're not going to pay for it. I mean, we like the idea of it. We kind of like the idea of it. But we don't actually want legitimate representation. What they had recognized, I think, was that they didn't want a career in silviculture. 15% of that group of 1,000 wanted a career in silviculture. If that's true of what the overall industry is, that's a very small number of people that are looking for a career in silviculture. What people are looking for are money, good money, easy, you know, the, and, and the culture in tree planting is, is good, but they can only do that for five, six, seven years. You know, I just had my hip replaced. Here's a, you know, this isn't a sob story, 25 years of work in this industry and I've had a hip replacement. I could have quit earlier. Simple as that. You know, it's, it's one of the other untold stories about this is that, you know, if you're in this for any length of time, in the delivery model that we have, which requires production and high output by the body, you're not going to make it for very long. Something is going to give unless you're Superman. And I thought I was, and that was pretty close. But, but I wasn't. I wasn't there. You know. I just wonder if that's something that that like you've got all these people graduating with these human kinetics degrees and like knowledge of the body and how the body can be supported in physical labor and what could be like what can be done to educate people so that they have more of an identity as a as like when they first come into the industry they know what can be done to support them, like their whole health kind of within the industry. So that, I mean, I feel like uh, I would, I mean, it is kind of career now, I've been doing it for long enough, that um, having people to look towards, to look like icon, you know, ident an identity to move towards, to say, okay, 
a lot of people, I would think, don't call themselves career tree planters because they don't know what that looks like. Looks like a guy with a replacement security. Well, <laughs> 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 I'm going to tell you what it looked like because. Uh, I, I started shortly after Michael in the industry and I started in Ontario and then I came, I worked for Jebe Kutov for Brinkman and I ended up, I wanted a, I wanted a camp with, with showers and a cook, you know. The cooking for ourselves and bathing in a trout stream wasn't really cutting in May 15th in Northern Ontario. But when I met the people from BC and then I came out here, I saw that there were people that had families, I saw people that could buy a house, you know, this is the 80s and, and, uh, and I said, and I'd already graduated from university by the time I started. And then, you know, I ended up in the Coobies, met people of like mind, and I could see a, a future for myself. But it was early enough that you could actually buy a house, pay for a house, you know, and work many days, lots of days. And, you know, I don't know, and I have a crew that is that is only experienced and very productive, and, you know, we have, have a good culture, but they're, they're all about the money. And for me, that's great, you know, you can like, like people who work hard. But I don't see, I, I, I don't see, and you guys can tell me if it's different, because I'm just not exposed to it, but I don't see that, that opportunity that I saw when I came to BC and saw the life sort of unfolded in front of me. I have two friends that have just had babies that work for the company that I work for and then have families and are tree planting. And I was surprised, mostly because anyone gets pregnant and I'm kind of surprised, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the nature of like, that actually changed, transformed my when I saw, started to see people having making families on in this career. I thought, oh, so it is a job. Like it's not just, a, it's not just this thing I do for a couple months. And I there's another point too about the broad, like the integration of the silviculture industry a bit better. I don't do brushing and that stuff mostly because I don't really know what it how to get into it and it's it's always thrown at you at the end of the season it's like you've got two days do you want to do it and you're like well actually I, you know I just I just decided I was going to do something else because I only found out today that you want me to do something and I feel like that that kind of turnover is not good for it. like your brain as a human you just like to have some things you can rely on and sometimes I know that's not possible but Transparency. Okay, well, that, no, that's a really good point that you don't know about other things. So, John, you've got your hand up and I'll come, come back. Can I go back to the, we got to a point there where... The Speak story, loud, John. Can I just go back to earlier part of the conversation? We got to the point and the question was, you know, would you recommend somebody in the industry? We kind of hit a dead end there. Can we maybe rephrase that? Because obviously, all of you, all of you who said that are still in the industry for some reason. So maybe we could ask you, um, to tell us what would be the, the things that need to change, the three to five things that would change where you would say to somebody, you know, why don't you come tree planting? Because I understand some of those issues around security and respect, a long enough season. What are the specific things that, that you know, we could do as, as uh, employers and also with industry to try and turn that around? Well, again, this is something I, I, I was hesitant to even mention because I, I don't know the ins and outs of things and the inner workings and what's economically feasible and whatnot, but I do know that it basically... Oh, okay. But most, I'm okay, I'm just going to throw it out there. And most other industries are just people in general, in your life, in your relationships, in your work, whatever, it doesn't matter what you're doing, uh, you crave some sort of recognition, some opportunities for advancement. People as a species like to be able to evolve. And what is it, Michael? Michael. Okay. What he was saying a moment ago, yes, there's, there's careers for contractors, there's a career for a supervisor, and that's pretty much where it ends. And, and that's true. If people felt that there was some sort of upward mobility in planting, and I'm even in between being a supervisor, uh, do you know what I mean? Or going all balls out and buying a company or what have you. Like, uh, benefits, maybe. If you get people at that five year precipice, and it exists, if you come back for your sixth year, you can bet your ass you're going to come back for 10. It's more than possible. You get people and they're lingering and they're not too sure what they're going to do, if they're going to carry on down another road. If you grab them at that juncture and it's like, all right, you come back next year, I'll say you're going to have benefits like perhaps two months prior and two months post the season. Get a tooth fixed, you know what I mean? Get some work done on your body that is falling apart. 
doing this work. You know what I mean? There needs to be some sort of incentive, maybe a graduated pay scale. Like, you know, you come back your sixth year and say, all right, we're gonna throw an extra half a cent your way, veteran. You put in the time, you're coming back, we wanna. You have to entice people. You have to wave that carrot in their face or you're gonna lose them. And she was speaking about a, a microcosm of that. And it's that whole last minute, here now, um, temporary feeling of the planting industry. You need to instill that feeling of permanence in people. And you need to uh, make them feel like there is some sort of a future, or even that you know that they exist outside of the three, four, or six months, or whatever, that they work for you. Do you know what I mean? You exist outside of this planting camp. I will send you an email once in a blue moon throughout the year that has your name at the top and isn't just a form letter, and it's like, how are you doing? Little tiny things like that matter. They bring people back. If you own the company, get your ass into the camps during the year. Come in, do you know what I mean? The places that I've been where the owner is visible, he's around, I eat dinner with the guy, I see him in the morning, he comes up to the block and he's not just some intimidating spectral figure that shows up once a month and stares at me from his Tacoma and I never friggin' see him again, okay? Things like that make a difference. Do you know what I mean? When you've got a bunch of people grumbling at a table and you know they're lingering and they're all pissed off about some block, it takes something as simple as walking up and putting your hand on their shoulder and like, yeah, I know today was hard. We'll see if we can work out something better for you next week. Even if it doesn't fucking happen, you said that. <laughs> and it makes a huge difference, you know what I mean? There's lots of things you can do, but yeah, fair remuneration, possibility for advancement, respect, feeling like you exist outside of the planting camp, and the visibility of the owners. These things are huge, and these will make people stay. As far as attracting new people, eh, I don't know now, because now we're saying we're dealing with a whole different kind of person, and also amalgamation of the sectors and labor pool sharing, which you were speaking about, that's brilliant. Because the other thing about planters is they're flighty. Okay, and I hate to give you this ammo, actually, to keep people in the industry, because it is crippling, okay? Like, my body is falling apart, because I've been going all out the whole time. But they're flighty catch them when they're starting to wonder and they're like, oh, well maybe I'll just go sit around on EI and do nothing for the rest of the year. You throw another job in their face and you do it soon enough, not two days before it's gonna happen, they'll go. Do you know what I mean? If somebody's spending some time in the off season and they're sitting there thinking that they're gonna go in another direction, you jump on them, they get that out of nowhere email that's like, hey Christine, yeah, I know your name, looking forward to seeing you back next year, how's the kids? Or something as simplistic as that. You just got that person with their mind back on planting again. And it was so, it's so simple, little tiny things like that, and big things like paying people properly because guess what, this cripples you. And I don't know, I don't know how to summarize that any better than Aaron did. John, it's good. I, don't, I don't think I have an answer to your question, John, but one thing I should clarify, when I'm saying earlier I would not advise someone to start a career as a planner right now, on the other hand, someone who has done it for a year, I will do everything to tell them they're a fool to quit. So maybe that means that getting over that hurdle of the first year, in my mind, is the problem. Yeah, I agree completely with Scooter on that. And then on the subject of um, pay scale, I think it's interesting to note something we saw come out of the WSCA uh, survey. That survey was probably filled out based on distribution methods by people that had pl been planting for longer periods of time. Like, I don't think that got out to many rookies. I don't think that got out to many, like, second year planters. I'm not sure how many companies emailed it out. I think that might be an opportunity for contractors to get some better information out there. But even with that survey, which was weighted towards the upper end, End, we saw that workers reported a daily average of, I believe it was 287 for 52 or 53 days. And when you looked at the number of days people wanted, across the board on that survey, people said they wanted more days. 20 more is with the students, like 40 more with the people that describe themselves as seasonal workers. So, and then in terms of wages that people expected, this group said that they thought an experienced worker should be making like I can't remember exactly, but 3.30 or so. And so this is sort of the upper end. This is what the upper end say that like people should be getting in terms of number of days and in terms of amount. And I think that that's really revealing that people, even the vets, don't think that the industry is in a spot where people are getting what people think they should be getting. And I think obviously, as that survey gets out to more and more people, better data will become available. But I think what we can see is that wages aren't where people expect them to be, and that number of days worked aren't where people want them to be. And so those are two opportunities. I know that like tons and tons of the trees in the industry go in between May 15th and June 
June 15th, pushing trees into July, even though foresters hate it. Like, if we could get a lot more trees in July, that would be definitely to the advantage of, I know, lots of students that I talk to that get laid off, you know, end of June, mid-June, and, like, get desperate for work. And I see friends that, you know, end up spending, like, half of June, July, and August working minimum wage after they're planting because they didn't set up something better. And those people would love to do a 75-day season planting two weeks into August to have a lot of money going to, to that school year but they can't get it, and that's something that the industry could do better for them. Or, or if there's a shortage of trees, so you can't make the season longer because everyone's just gonna fight over those trees. Diversification, do something else in August. I don't know why, I don't have an answer, but. Um, I, I really wanted to point out something that I, I think I see emerging here in terms of framing the issue, is that I see, I really see three different issues or three different levels at which this relationship needs to be evaluated, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the veteran, the career workers, and, and that. And, and we don't want to necessarily just focus on that. There's also this recruitment issue of just finding people in the first place. Then there's this midpoint issue of once you get that recruit, making sure that you hold on to them for you know a few years. I think the difference between a one and two year worker is, is huge from a four to five, even six year worker in terms of the return it gives to use your company and use the industry. So you have to look at these three different issues, recruitment, retention over the short term for a lot of people that are simply, no matter what you do, never going to stay in it for a long time, and then the retention of the people that really, really matter. Um, so I think that there's different strategies and different things that need to be considered for each of those three distinct issues. Um, the second thing I wanted to bring up is um, it, it sort of flows from a couple of things I heard, one of them about planters being flighty or being mercenary and hopping around. And another one was that one of my employers, he would never use the term my workers, right? I always acknowledged that the workers were sort of free to come and go wherever they please. Um, and we know that workers move around a lot from one company to another. Um, therefore, any measures that you might be taking to retain workers or to attract workers, you will benefit, I think, by sharing it with the rest of the industry. There needs to be sharing amongst the contractors too about the things that they're finding effective. Because the stronger of a bond that you can form with your workers, that's going to be good for the industry. Um, I, I do see see things happening out there. I don't, of course, you know, I don't comment individually about specific companies and stuff. But sometimes I see things happening in the industry that I see are positive steps, and it'd be interesting to hear some of the contractors talk about about the things that they might be doing that are helping them or working. Um, one of the things that I've seen happen that I think is a very positive development that I think addresses one of the issues here is some of the positive things about the industry. Like Marianne, you talked about some of the real negative things happening. Well, I think there's also been some efforts to, to repair that image. I look at um, the six billionth tree, obviously, I think was, was a nice statement. Um, also, I look at uh, what some of the contractors have been doing in Merritt. Um, people who I know personally have been having a planter appreciation day in the town of Merritt. And there's a growing acknowledgement in that community about what those contractors and those workers bring to the community. And there's, the planters have a bit more swagger now going down to the Grand or going down to the Mandolins for a coffee or something. They feel a lot more welcome there. And this is really a contractor-led initiative to get together to have a celebration in the town where all the workers get to come and the workers are showing appreciation for the town. The money from that event is being donated to the youth center, I understand. And at the same time, the industry is showing appreciation to the workers. I look at that and I go, that, is, that was a really special thing, and a very conscientious and I think um, progressive step by those employers. And I think you, you need to collectively look at some of those steps and think about um, maybe how much of an impact that has on developing a bond with the workforce and whether or not there should be more attention paid to some of these, some of these measures. And sharing those ideas with each other because you know, if you if you help your neighbors, I think in the long run it is going to help the industry as well. Okay, good comment. I, I, I want to just ask a bit about. Okay, Michael, go ahead. I, I just sort of wanted to go to something Nick was talking about earlier. You know, the climate that I came up in was quite a lot more continuous because I worked with companies like Timberline, for instance, where you know everybody basically had come from the Comox Valley and 
the crew is 95% local and you worked in the Comox Valley or you worked up at the north end of the island and it, you, you, when you joined Timberline, if you were one of the five or six people that were hired from outside, this is back in the 90s, you actually joined a community. It wasn't just the community of the camp or the community of a, 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 a transient community that you know you might come back next year. You are now a part of the Comox Valley inner sanctum, as it turns out, because that's a lot of pretty high-end characters that you were working with, and their parents have been loggers, or they've been fishermen, or they, you know, there was a whole history. And, and Steve Allen, who I had a good fortune to work with, understood this element of BC business and, and history very well, and he. He promoted that. He had good relations with the IWA. He had good relations with the people in his community. And you bought you, people had houses and children. And it was very different from the experience that I'm hearing is is, is sort of the general experience in tree planting. That's that colored a great deal of my own experience. And what colored it even more back in the wilder hippie days. And something you might like to know about is we used to actually have kids in camp. And you know Tony knows about this, and but we, you know, I was in a camp where we had 14 kids for a couple of years. You know, we actually had to have barriers in the camp because, like, was, there were some planters who did not like the idea that there was that many children running around, and there's, you know, it, it was crazy. We'd have a, a plywood cutoff point, you know, just <laughs> not go beyond that, you know, whatever. But you know, we had daycare. We had this wasn't just once. It was a, a part of a of a, an early vision of what this was all about. We were actually full blown, whatever, stoned out of our gourds idealists that we're saving the world. You know, some of us. More than would probably care to admit, you know, at this point. And uh, there, we, there we were, that was the chunk of it. There was a, there was a hope for a, a, a new kind of way of living in relationship to the resource base and the environment and everything else. And that, that changed, it's changing, it's changed. We, we're in a different, Climate. But I think that the, the continuity that was promised there is, is it goes to what you were talking about, you know. It's about community building. This is the bottom line as far as I'm concerned. You know, we need to re-embed silviculture in the community of this province. You know, it, the kids in Caswell, six kids in Caswell who don't want to go to school and don't want to be academic should be able to work for 20 years in a valley or two, you know, up the Duncan looking after all the applications of keeping the trees that a, a, a crew has come in and planted. I understand that the biological windows and the efficiency of, of having tree planting be the main, you know, the way it's done now, be the way we deliver it is great, but there's a whole other chunk of this picture which, you know, would reintegrate this province and forestry in particular in a very profound way, and I think we're not addressing that particularly well. I was gonna go back to you run your blog, and I want to know about one of the parts of our labor market program, if we get that funding for that, is outreach. And, and I'm listening also to Natalia Lee say you know, that that's a, we need to reach, workers would appreciate, I'm hearing that actually from more than, from quite a few of you actually, that you just <laughs> treat us like we're intelligent life and you'd be surprised how we, we, we might respond. Um, but what's the, what's the traffic like, how do we reach the, the workforce? And, and I'll, I'll start with you, because you obviously and set an exemplary standard. Are you getting the same, tra are you getting tired traffic, the same traffic, different, what, what's? I'm, I'm definitely getting higher traffic every year. Um, right now, these these four months, January to April, leading up to the interior planning season, definitely the busiest time of the year. Uh, right now, probably averaging 1,200, 1,400 people a day on the site. So it's definitely getting some visibility. But what I don't think a lot of people appreciate, maybe especially the contractors, is that my site is not the predominant way that people are sharing information anymore. Things have changed a lot in the last two years. There's a lot of information sharing on Facebook that none of you can see. None of us can necessarily see because Facebook is so far old and private. But I see little glimpses from some friends and I know that there's others out there. There's a lot of talk behind the scenes that you as contractors can never access. And so you've got to do things that make the workers talk about you in a good manner without being supervised. Like there's, it's hard to explain. It's, uh, you know, it's, not, it's something that we can't control. The only way it's gonna be controlled is if the planters are happy. That's the only way they will advertise planting. 
And it seems interesting to me, like I, I started interviewing kids on the street in Caswell because I needed to get up to snuff on what was going on in the tree planting industry, you know, at this point, having been out of it. And I, I happen to know quite a few of your yeah, crew, right, Chris, because yeah. you seem to be recruiting heavily out of my community there. Well, they're all sons and daughters of tree planters. They there. are. And so, so I had a couple of them, the Mercy Brothers, and you know, yeah. and I, I, I just asked them, like, is tree planting cool still? You know, I mean, what's the attraction? Why? You know? And uh, they invariably they said it's it's about being with their kind, you know, like together, you know, the community thing, the lifestyle. It was a lifestyle choice, and there was more money there than you can make in the city. You know, it is the word of mouth out there. They want this to be what it's what the myth is, and it, and to a great extent, the myth is true. I mean, the other aspect of this. Is, Thing that we're not talking about is that you find your way in this industry from the rookie training companies to the companies where you can work for five or ten years and make good money. And I, whether it's right or not, that is the way there's a kind of a natural selection process of foot or something. That's how this industry is stratified. Nobody, Nick will not hire a rookie. He's hired one last year. One. I, it, I, you know, but basically, policy is practice. It's a, it's a good policy. You're going to make money if you have experienced planners. He's waiting for people to hit a certain training level, a certain experience level, and then they're welcome to come and they've got good work for as long as they can handle it. That's the mechanism that we've got going here. And if you last three years, then you, you might find a berth for the company where you can make a lot of money and have a good life. But that's a, it's an odd mechanism. If, if I can talk for a second, your missing word there was recruit. Yes. When you use retrain, yes. retain twice. Um, in terms of recruiting, to me it seemed that for the last several years, um, okay, well for the last three years, well the industry's been downsizing, there hasn't been a whole lot of pressure on recruitment because you have certainly some people leaving, but there's less and less people in the industry every year. We're about to go into a stage for certainly this summer and next summer anticipated 15% like more. Um, we're in a stage where we could be in the same sort of situation where we've got to hire far, far more people than we have for the last few years. And I think it was about five years ago or perhaps six years ago, we had one summer that uh, it was just so tough to get new people. I think that's coming, that's, that's staring us in the face. I don't know if it'll be this summer, certainly next summer is going to be really tough. Now, you look across the country, going from east to west, the prices get better as you come west, professional in, professionalism increases, whatnot, and the experience levels increase. We, as when I say we, thinking of myself as part of the group of interior companies, we've been trying to do a bit of recruiting from Ontario and even from the Maritimes. And as far as the coastal companies go, they draw from us, not so much from Ontario. But you see this progression as, as some people move across the country. The people in Ontario and the people in New Brunswick have started to take notice of it, and they're starting to fight back. I heard from an Irving foreman in New Brunswick last week I was talking with, and he said that last year, Irving, instead of doing group planting, they've gone to individual piece rates last year for the first time. He also said that instead of using potapukis, they started using shovels for the first time, and I asked why, and he said it's because you're stealing all our planters out west. We're trying to emulate your model so we stop losing people. In Ontario, companies that have terrible, terrible reputations, like A&M, they have started saying that this year they're going to pay for reef run loadings. They're now paying minimum wage. So I think this is kind of indicative of the same thing, where Ontario is paying attention to us. And the end result is that it's going to be harder for us to draw from Ontario and New Brunswick to bring people out west. People that work for coastal companies that don't hire rookies may not care about that as much, but you should because ultimately you draw from us. So it's all going to be a cyclical thing. So I think this is something you should think about. I wonder if there could be some kind of, like we always have these job fairs, we're just thinking back to the university planting, but like we always have these job fairs where there's these, all these different businesses that come and there's some kind of coordinated like effort by the Western Contracts. 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 <laughs> Just like if you guys put together, a, if you guys put together some kind of banner and, and brought yourselves as like or 
delegated people to go to these things, you you do well attracting, just having more of a profile. Because there's art there. I mean, I know from writing those articles in the paper and the feedback, like I didn't have a lot of people asking questions and interested in work and don't care that you know I can tell them well you, you know you might not have chances or you're not going to make tons of money, but you will make something and you have fun. And it's worth your time and. Um, but the, there's not, because there's not a lot of, you know, they got, they're asking, I'm writing this in, what, December, January, and then they've got to wait months, and they might not hear back from people, and, and I don't know, so getting people, getting the tree planters that are already living in the communities, probably sitting on the eye, not doing much, up and about talking to people would be, I think mean, you, most tree planters would say yes, they'd be like, sure, I would talk to kids, like, I'd talk to young people, and facilitate things, and, that's actually something that's really easy to do and um, Spectrum Resource Group, they had me do that in Ontario. And it worked out really well. So the year that I went back and did job fairs in Ontario, Spectrum had a huge number of AM, Woodlot, you know, all those larger name employ uh, employers from Ontario, just this plethora, this insurgence came that year. And it was something that was really easy to do, it was cost effective. I was already going home, I was already at home. So it's something that would be easier to coordinate. Judy? get that here. We know those figures of 2.7, 2.3, 1.9, they're low. And if we can keep a majority of people for four years, yeah, that, that would be really great. And I'm curious, because I, I know that tree planting money isn't what it used to be 20 years ago, because I was a university student 20 years ago and planted trees. And um, so I know it's not what it used to be, but if, if you've got a camp that's averaging, say, 250 bucks a day, that's 25 bucks an hour, and, and my nephews are going out and working for $12 an hour, and they're university students. And I guess I don't understand, there's a disconnect here for me. Why, why do we get people that that work for two years and they do make that 250 bucks a day. Uh, the first year for sure is the hardest, but they're, they're getting 55 day seasons because they're working in July, they're making that, that 250 bucks a day, but yet they, they don't always wanna stay. And we have a lot of people who stay for four years, but why do we have people that stay for two? And and how is it that $250 a day or 25 bucks an hour is not good enough? Because I don't know, except for people, kids who work in the oil patch, of which there's very few. I lived in Edmonton for years, and I did not know university students who, lived, who worked in the oil patch. They were high school dropouts, that, that, and no offense, but they were. They, they were the ones making 25 bucks an hour. So I'm, I'm confused about it because I don't see university students making 25 bucks an hour, except I, for tree planters. I, I can think of one simple mistake that might be happening. When I ran a, a campus pub for years, for bar staff, I would never hire third and fourth year students. I'd hire first and second years because I'd have them for three years until they graduate. Maybe that's the same thing happening here. Maybe a lot of people are hiring people in the third and fourth year of university, and once they graduate, they're gone. So maybe, People just are ignoring a simple little thing that they don't realize is kind of important. Look for the young students.